Ladies and gentlemen, if your chess news that you receive is on a bit of a 24 to 48 hour lag, let me fill you in on the fact that Hikaru Nakamura is now a candidate in 2022. He has made it to the tournament of eight players where they play a double round robin, so 14 games, to qualify to play against Magnus Carlsen, aka the world champion. Now we know seven out of eight candidates because we're currently waiting for Dingley Ren to finish his 30 qualifying games. I made a video about that yesterday. But let's just say our candidates field is done. In this video, I'm going to take you through what I think are Hikaru's chances to actually win the entire thing. Yes, that is actually a very real reality that we are living in because it's Hikaru's form has been excellent in the Grand Prix, He's performing at a 2845 rating. And let me know if you want me to make kind of videos like this period where I analyze everybody's chances head to head. I'm gonna talk about Hikaru because let's be honest, I mean, the online chess world exploded in many forms and he is a major reason for that. And a lot of people are very excited to see how he's going to do. So six games. Take you through uh, timestamps around the video player. Over the years, his head-to-head -head scores against different players and the candidates, uh, except Ferruja. Ferruja is going to be missing because he's never played Hikaru in classical, so I don't have any classical games. They only have Rapid and Blitz. The last game is who I think is Hikaru's biggest challenge. Here we go. This is a game from 2014, Tata Steel, when Hikaru has the black pieces. Let me actually flip it. Versus Richard Report. This is the last time they played a... Uh, I, I think this is the last time they played a classical game against each other. No, they might have played one other one. Hikaru leads the head-to-head -head score 3-0. Uh, um, th but this was the most exciting, I think. This was from 2014. So they've played two more since then. Uh, Report plays a super weird opening. You can be willing to bet he is not going to be playing this uh, when it comes time to... Uh, to, to, to go to the candidates uh, in Madrid in 2022. Uh, but again, Hikaru uh, leads the head-to-head 3-0 -head with two draws, and he is not gonna shy away from a fight against Report. Like, Report likes to get into fist fights on the board, uh, so does Hikaru. Uh, my man is going to uh, really come out and fight. He kicks out Report's bishop. Bishop f1, the knight moves, this knight moves, and Hikaru tries to lock down his pawn on e4 uh, as bishop b2 is developed. Hikaru takes some space. Report plays the move h3, looking to maybe get g4. It's kind of difficult for black to develop the pieces over here because if you play a very natural move like this, suddenly comes g4, the bishop is booted, and the pawn is lost. So how is Hikaru going to play this position? Well, simple. He's going to advance on both sides of the board. He's like a giant warship. He's, only, he's going to advance in the middle, on the right side, and on the left side. I mean, my man is just going to crowd the entire board. Report plays a3 to stop b4 and maybe advance on that side. Hikaru now begins a rerouting procedure with his knight, a4, b4, and now both knights drop back to e2, and Rapport is offering up the d5 pawn, because if you take this with black, here comes knight g3 attacking the bishop, here comes knight c4 hitting the knight and the pawn. Very, very messy position. And uh, Hikaru here uncorks a beautiful move, and it, it, in, in, in all the games of this video, we're really gonna be showing Hikaru's like, flamboyant playing style, very, very nice playing style that he has uh, cultivated over the years. Uh, he drives into e3. Just a full sacrifice of a piece. Uh, the point is that if you take on e3 here, runs in with the queen, uh, king f2 defends, and uh, black would have played d5, and I think this is what Hikaru was going for, a piece sacrifice to completely lock down the middle, and then play bishop d6, or maybe rook h6, rook g6, this position is anything but easy, and it would have been wild of Report to do this, to completely tie himself down like this. I think Black is doing very well. He opted not to take on e3, instead playing queen e2, and allowing knight c2, but Hikaru doesn't even take the rook. He doesn't take the rook because he doesn't want to lose his bishop. His knight would be stuck in the corner and be lost on the next move because he can't take. Knight e4, etc. So Hikaru doesn't even do that, instead moving his bishop out of the way giving this to report, but then d5 again. So Hikaru is really dead set on sacking that knight. He doesn't want that knight anymore. He wants to lock the middle. Report's like, no, the middle must be open. Hikaru's like, all right, queen e7, no problem. That knight is still hanging, by the way. He just had to protect his king. He still doesn't take it. Report still doesn't take the knight. Finally, Hikaru's like, all right, I mean, if you're going to give me the rook, you're going to give me the rook, right? This was the last chance that queen c2 could have happened, and then Hikaru would have played d5. This is what the, the... They had this tension the entire game. Take my knight. No, take my knight. No, take my knight. And finally, Report plays with fire a little bit uh, too close to the fire and just gets a little too excited for his own good. 
I mean, a report, th this is actually one of the reasons we haven't seen report in the top 10 in the world sooner, I feel like, because he used to do stuff like this. I mean, it's just insane what he's doing. Knight f6, if it works, it's beautiful. But the problem is when you get a cold-blooded calculator like Hikaru, he's going to get to a position where he has a nine-point material advantage. And even though things look shaky, he just plays a couple of chill moves like king d7. White has no checks. White finally is like, wow, I'm in a lot of peace debt. Let me take the knight. Well, let me trade queens with you. And Hikaru, in this position, could have moved his rook out of the way. He could have played rook h6 and allowed a5 with more initiative, removing the knight from the defense. But Hikaru is a savage. He understands he doesn't always need the material. Look at this. He gives away the knight and the rook to report because he can boot back his pieces and transform into a winning endgame. Hikaru was just up nine points of material but he didn't hang on to it and instead just went to an endgame where he advances, has two connected passers, and wins the game literally two moves later. He wins it two moves later because the pawns will just go. Like, Report can play, you know, Report didn't have to play. He could have tried to play like Rook E3, then C4 and gotten his bishop out, but it doesn't matter. Rook D8. And Hikaru, by the way, won this game without even moving a piece. He gave Report peace odds, basically. Crazy. So, he's capable of such things. And this is 2014. I mean, we're talking about a long time ago. But as we move closer and closer to the present day, we start really facing some serious opposition. The next person I'd like to cover is Ding Li Ren. This is a game from Sinkfield Cup, 2016. Hikaru and Ding have played seven classical games against each other. Hikaru is 1-0 with six draws. Never lost to Ding Li Ren in classical. This is the game. The other games they've drawn. Now, in this game, Ding Li Ren plays a semi-slav uh, where he takes on c4. Uh, this is a ultra th sharp. I mean, from the years like 2010 to 2017, 2018, the theory that has been cultivated in the semi-slav where black takes on c4, then attacks with g5 and b5, hanging on to this pawn but giving white the center. I mean, there's been alpha zero games here. Alpha zero made a lasting impression on this position with white, basically saying black's position sucks. And uh, even for the cost of a pawn, black is way overextended. So Hikaru didn't know about that because it's 2016 uh, and instead just played the main line. So he attacks Black's weakness on G5, making Ding Li Ren push forward, knight E5. And here Black likes to trade off that knight. And White says, no problem because I get a bishop to E5, right? And now I'm pitting your knight to this. We have queen E7 and now the entire purpose of the White position. What do you do? You're kind of clamped on both sides, right? Not in the middle. White definitely has the advantage in the middle. Now White says, excuse me, B3. The main line here for black now is rook g8, unpinning, defending yourself, and uh, looking to meet this with this move. So looking to meet the bc capture with b4 to remove the white knight. Uh, Ding played this, and you see the point. White has six pawns, black has seven, but black's position is, I mean, looks like a Jackson Pollock, right? I think that's a good, it's just like, just paint everywhere. I hope that's a good reference. I, I could be totally wrong. I'm sorry if it is. I mean... Like, a6, right? Black is holding things together, and the position is in the balance, and black is hoping white goes here, so that you at least open up a file and give some play. Hikaru plays a novelty, queen c1. <clears throat> queen c1. Never been played before at the time. Uh, some novelties are good, some novelties are bad. We're about to see the, the point. And now he castles. So the queen has two, two purposes. Laser beam and pressure on the c-file, right? Let, let's see what happens. Ding plays knight h5, and Hikaru explodes the center of the board with the move d5. And uh, yeah, knight h5 is looking to attack and queen h4 is coming. So knight h5 gets the knight here and looks for queen h4 and Hikaru's like, go ahead. I mean, to the untrained eye, this looks awful. Like literally, I mean, this looks like black goes here and it's made on a couple of moves. So Hikaru really needs to know what he's doing. He plays g3, he kicks out the queen and he takes on c6. And now we see the purpose. The queen will hit that bishop when things clear out and will probably get in on the c-file. Ding takes the bishop. Because if he takes on c6 like this, uh, knight takes b5. And bishop b5, bishop b5, it's just game over because the rook is pinned. So that was probably the deep idea of playing queen c1. It was honestly all of this he probably thought would happen. And uh, now he kicks out, queen e5, he takes. Looks like black has stabilized, but black has not stabilized at all. Shocking knight d5. Incredible. Knight d5. It's actually the black king who has to be careful about his safety because the queen is ready to go to c8 using that pawn as an anchor. When Hikaru played all of this, I wonder how much of this was prep. Did he know this pawn was going to be down here with the queen being the anchor? It's incredible. I mean, honestly, incredible stuff. I don't know how much of this was prep versus just understanding the ideas. 
queen c8, king e7. Black doesn't actually have to take the queen. But it doesn't matter because here comes the rook. The rook is going to give the queen a helping hand. The black king has no moves. Completely paralyzed. So at some point, something's going to happen here. Ding sacks the knight in a desperate attempt to create counterplay on the king and force a draw. Hikaru doesn't take and the bishop comes. All the pieces have abandoned the white position because they're going to swarm this king. And uh, in all good positions like this, 92 gets the bishop back so that it stops cutting off the king. In all good positions, there is a final blow. And Hikaru plays rookie six check, giving up his rook to take this one. And Ding resigns after 28 moves because now the queen's going to move and the pawn promotes. And uh, two games in a row, by the way, the bishop on f8 didn't move. Kind of funny. Uh, but uh, in this game, it was uh, Hikaru beating Ding, the only game that he's ever beaten him, and in very convincing fashion. Now, admittedly, this was five years ago. Things have changed. Ding the Ren is, you know, 2808, uh, not 2755, but uh, you see what I'm talking about. I mean, a flair for the dramatic and exciting. We continue to look at his opponents. Timur Rajabov is the wild card spot because he didn't play in the last candidates due to COVID. He thought COVID was a serious issue, uh, and they said, all right, so leave. And then the tournament got canceled halfway through. That is exactly what happened. That's why he's playing in this event. They gave him the wild card. Uh, this is a game from Mallorca in Spain uh, in 2017. This is uh, one of their most recent meetings. And Hikaru against Rajabov is 2-0 with 12 draws. So, so far, Hikaru is 6-0 with 20 draws against the players that I'm showing you. He's never lost to any of them. He takes Rajabov into a Rosalimo in 2017, and, and, and uh, Rajabov plays this 97 line, okay? He plays this kind of... And by, notice how Hikaru's play D4 in one game, E4 in one game, I mean, diversifying the openings. We have an ultra cutting-edge main line. Uh, Hikaru retreats back here because the knights are sort of scattered. That's why the white bishop can afford to go out and come back. Normally, when you play the Rosalimo, you want to take on C6. But when black plays this setup, right? <clears throat> Voice is cracking. Throat's been bothering me recently. When black plays this setup, you're not going to take. You're just going to come back. And the most interesting development of this position happens right here because white does this to prevent black from playing d5 and play c4. This is what white wants in these positions. Hikaru plays knight c3. Different move order. And now it's very tricky to choose how to play the black position. Normally, black complements the e6 pawn with the a6 pawn. But normally, this knight is here, which is a massive difference because, well, you'll find out. Queen c7, f4, typical. Uh, and Rajabov decides to play the Sicilian like this by putting the bishop on b7. Hikaru drops his queen back, so it's no longer going to be a target. Bishop b7, bishop c6 to prevent anything from coming to b5. And now G uh, a3 to prevent bishop b4. And now g3. And now you see why the knight is not well placed on that square. Because what ends up happening is you need to move your bishop because the knight has to go there, because it's certainly not going to go to h8. That would be really ugly and depressing. Uh, rook c8, but now e5. Where's the bishop going? Where's the knight going? This is the problem. Hikaru pushes every pawn in front of his king to start an attack on Rajabov. Now, these kinds of attacks are relatively common in Sicilians, but let's see how Rajabov's going to deal with it. Bishop a6. Now, Hikaru for a, just like that first game, he's winning in the middle, He's winning on the king side, he's winning on the queen side, right? If you play bishop b7, you allow something to come to b5. So rook b8, and I really hope you had the patience to make it 13 minutes in this video, because here Hikaru plays one of the most savage moves I've ever seen in my life. I, I can't believe I've never seen this game before today. How do you make progress here with white? Sure, you can play moves like queen e2, go here, double up. No. Queen d6. Are you kidding me? This man just sacked a queen for a positional advantage. Huh? Yes, you're looking at that correctly. If queen d6, this bishop is paralyzed like, and, and has to go here, but the queen is trapped. The black queen is literally trapped, and now the pawn on d6 is a permanent thorn. And what else here white has is the three on two. And watch as Hikaru goes to work. This is like, you know, I, I, I hate to say it because obviously the winner of the candidates plays him, but this is Magnesian style, all right? Look at this isolation of weaknesses, right? You can take on c2. Go ahead. I mean, yeah, I know rook g2 is scary. So what? I, I'll trade rooks with you, no problem. Look at this complete positional domination. And watch as Rajabov fights back. The problem with Rajabov's position, the entire position was this knight. The knight was booted back and had to spend many moves getting involved, finally. And yes, Rajabov takes all of Hikaru's pawns. Literally all of them. All of them. But the most important one survives. 
And Hikaru wins this game by bringing his bishop back. And the final domino to fall in the black position will be what? And by the way, if you're confused here, Hikaru's not taking on f8 because while he can do this and get the bishop, he's lost too many pawns. So Hikaru has to understand that he lost an entire side of the board. So he can't just make a queen and give up a and get a piece for it. He's got to make a queen and keep it. How's he going to keep it? b4. Rajab resigns. If you play g5, I play b5, b6, and b7. And that's it. I will go b7 and a8, and I will shield the pawn from the bishop. Incredible. There's nothing black can do. Black is completely defenseless. I mean, I don't know. This is like three games now. We've And of course, listen, the point of this video is not that Hikaru beats everybody and nobody beats Hikaru. They, they trade wins in Rapid and Blitz, but against almost everyone in the world, except a guy named Magnus, Hikaru has a massive monster record in Rapid and Blitz. Against Dingley Ren, it's a little bit closer. So three games now we've seen. Now, this next game is also in 2017. We're going in chronological order. Yan Yipomnishi, of course, being another player in the candidates. Uh, this is the first guy that I'm showing you in this field that has ever beaten Hikaru in classical chess. 3-2. Hikaru has three wins. Nepo has two, including the most recent ones from Singfield Cup 2017 and Singfield Cup 2019. All right? Um, however, also in 2017, in the Grand Prix in Moscow, they played this game, and I wanted to showcase this game. Nepo is definitely a dangerous opponent for Hikaru, but I do not find him to be the most dangerous. He is probably the second most dangerous in this field. Obviously, we have Ferruja, but they've never played. I mean, Ferruja, we don't know. We, we honestly, as much as Ferruja's number two in the world, this is his first candidate, or number three now with Dingley Ren. So we don't know. So Nepo's up there as a, as a big threat, but I don't think he's the biggest one. So this was a Nidorf from 2017. Hikaru played bishop g5, e6, and again, we see Hikaru's handling of the Sicilians. Very, very uh, big sideline here, a3. Uh, queen d2, knight b3 are moves. Um, but a3, if you take my poison pawn, knight a4 traps your queen. So it's a common poison pawn trap. So there's some positions when sometimes the enemy queen attacks b2, you can trap the queen with moving your a pawn. Be very careful how you do this because you need to make sure it cannot go to any square, right? So right now everything is covered. It can't go to b5, b4, b6. So just be careful how you do it. Sometimes there's a bishop here and this doesn't work. Um, of course, Nepo doesn't take and we have the patented opposite side castling, although last time we had short side, right? But you can expect it's a Sicilian, so at some point these pawns are gonna go. Rook d8, and in this position, white scores very well with the move king b1. White also scores well with bishop takes f6. Hikaru plays bishop d3, which I think to this day has been played like eight times. Nepo tries to kick this bishop out, and Hikaru plays h4. And he's like, Jan, go ahead, take it. You want it so bad, go ahead. This is called the fishing pole or the fish hook. It's when you have a bishop, usually, that's targeted by an h-pawn on a castled king, and you play h4 because you have a rook down here. So you either haven't castled, or you're on the opposite side. And the point is this, and this is survivable maybe for black, but my god, is it terrifying, because white will go here, here probably, once the knight moves and it just, the game is over. Or move the g-pawn and go queen h2. So Nepo doesn't take and tries to just basically act cool. He's like, I'm playing it cool. Now, normally in these kind of positions, you have to move this queen. You have to play b5, b4, uh, maybe rook c8. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a little bit too complicated here. Like black has to get moving. When black is playing defensively, white now infiltrates and bad things begin to happen. de5, fe5, hg5, and finally the piece was taken, but at the cost of his own. And the position has now been ripped up. And even though Hikaru can make a move king b1 and still be down a pawn, and black has the bishop pair. You know, we always like to say bishop pair, right? Bishop pair. And black has the bishop pair. The attack is only for white. However, Nepo plays very fast, and he is a very resourceful defender. Don't think that the world championship proved the whole point. Uh, this, Nepo is a very tall task. I mean, it's a beat. You got to play fast. You got to be sharp. You got to understand all of his uh, defensive resources. He does a very nice job here cocooning and offering Hikaru a queen trade, which he promptly declines. But Nepo is trying to figure out the best place to put his king. Hikaru doesn't take his foot off the gas, sacking the knight on e6. Sacrificing the knight on e6 as black is scrambling. Fe6, queen e6. And uh, black here has to block with the bishop. Block with the bishop, go into this endgame where he is a pawn down and defend. That is not something 
I am completely convinced that Jan loves to do. I think Jan likes to try to defend in a bit more of a resourceful way, keep pieces on the board. I mean, obviously, you know, if you get Jan into an uncomfortable situation, make him, de make him defend a pawn down position, he might not do it. He might not do it, but I don't know. I haven't played Jan. See, here's the difference now, is that queen, uh, bishop comes in, rook f7 is a threat, bishop f7 is coming, and uh, Jan decides to give up the p, and, and, and material is equal. So he's not down anything, but his king is so weak. And rook d1, we, we boot around these pieces, and now Kikaru's gonna go gobble on b7. So he still found a way to be up, and uh, he tries to kick his queen out. Jan tries to play some defense here, but the game ends here with a fork. A very unique kind of fork. Queen d4. And black resigns. Why is this a fork? How is this a double attack? The rook is hanging. The pawn that's pinned to the king. Rook h6. Oh, wow. And if you did it this way, then the rook could just block. But because you do, or the queen could block and defend the rook. But this way, Jan resigns. So that was another game that he beat one of the candidates in 2017. But Jan is probably the second biggest rival. Three and two with, uh, with some draws. Also can compete with Hikaru on uh, pretty equal terms on um, Rapid and Blitz. Uh, <clears throat> next game, chronologically, is 2018, as Hikaru has the black pieces versus Jan Krzysztof Duda. This is a game in Gibraltar. Hikaru's head-to-head -head score against Duda, who was a World Cup uh, finalist, and that is how he qualified, is 1-0. They've only ever played one game, and this was the game. They've never played another uh, classical game. I think maybe they have some draws. Maybe. But I don't think so. Let me actually double check this. Uh, because I want to be accurate. This is a game played in... Uh, okay, let's take a look. They have played... No. This was the only classical game that Hikaru has ever played against Duda, I guess. That is, that is wild. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, that's what I thought, but I was like, really? And in this game from Gibraltar, uh, Duda went for... Well, actually, Hikaru went for a Dragon Sicilian. So another just, I mean, Hikaru can play anything. Literally, the guy can play anything. He knows a ton about every opening. Uh, the main line here we have is d5. So we have d5. White can also play bishop c4 before playing uh, castles. Um, and we get a, I mean, we just have one of the critical main variations here. Knight c6 is a move, but uh, Duda plays one of the second lines, which is queen to e1. And this reinforces the middle and has the rook pressure, the d file. We're not going to get into all the theory, but the players are following... Uh, variation that has been played thousands of times. I mean, literally thousands of times until this very moment. Here, there are several plans for white. Some plans involve moving the king first because it's just good to get the king off the file. It's just generally a good idea and make black make a move. Uh, knight e4 is also played sometimes. A very decent move with the idea of bishop c5 attacking the rook. Uh, also, there is just the general plan of opposite side castling and white going g4, h4, h5, and checkmating black. Uh, so white needs to make a couple more preparation kind of moves. And there are moves like bishop b3. Not right now, but just in general to stop the black counterattack, right? Just bishop b3. So Duda plays king b1. Hikaru lines the rook up directly to the king. And yeah, bishop b3 here is a very high scoring move. But uh, it's more modern, I think. I think in 2018 it wasn't extremely mainstream. Uh, so knight e4 is what Duda plays. And bishop c5, I just showed you this plan. Hikaru's rook moves and there's g4. Okay, I'm not lying to you. This, these are the plans by white. King b1, you know, knight e4, but like, this is what white wants. Black, though, is not going to go away because the dragon is one of the most resourceful openings that exists. And Hikaru lashes out with f5. You think, by the way, this is move 18, 19. You think that we're in a new territory. We're not. We're not at all. Uh, this has been played many, many times before. Uh, all of these moves, in fact, have been played before. I think this is, move 22 is the first move of the entire game where the players now are in new territory. Like there was a couple of games in correspondence or something. So h5, uh, king h7, and uh, I mean, just pandemonium. Like white is trying to not allow black to get counterplay on the queen side. Black pretty convincingly dealt with the white attack. So what the heck is going to go from here? Well, Hikaru plays knight f4. Now the rooks see each other, the bishops see each other, and the knights see each other. I mean, it's literally the most confrontational move that he had. Duda takes, Hikaru takes, Duda takes, Hikaru takes, Duda goes back to e1. Now, here Duda play, could have played bishop a3. This actually did more harm than good, I think, to Hikaru's position. Um, 
And I think there was there maybe something instead of knight f4, uh, like a computer likes knight c7 or maybe f4 trying to just go down this way. Uh, so Duda had a chance very briefly, and you kind of sit and wonder, how the heck can Hikaru even play this position? Like bishop d5, okay. How is Hikaru going to play? I mean, he, he has like no pawn moves. So Duda maybe should go this way. He goes this way, and now Hikaru's like, ha ha, that's all I needed, one pawn move. What? But what about bishop c5? Then queen f6 threatens mate. And then I take this. So I unpin my queen and I'm trying to get the f3 pawn, right? So c5, bishop d5, bishop a3, and Hikaru's won the pawn on f3. In a span of three moves, Hikaru's entire idea was to go here, threaten mate, and take this pawn. And if Duda had played something like queen f2, Hikaru would have just kept going. He would have just kept chugging along on the queen side and creating an attack. So a quick tactical skirmish leaves Duda in a position where he's a pawn down, and the attack is still not done. I mean, the bishop on g7, the rook on b7, the attack is still not over. So b3, queen d5, queen d4, and Duda has to defend this king by pushing the pawns in front of it. That's never a good sign, but the pressure's very good over here. So let's just march in with f3. Let's give Duda two attacks to think about. f2, whichever way you take, you are deflecting defenses. Because now I have the absolutely incredible, look at this combo from Hikaru, f2, if you take with the queen, I take your c3 pawn, look at this, rook e7, oh my, oh my, rook e7, oh my, and you have to now relinquish defense of this or rook e2, and Hikaru calculates to mate. Wow. Yeah, now... Of all the games I think that I've shown you today, this one is the least indicative of what is... No, I mean, maybe the report game. It's very old. But I don't think we're going to see a dragon in the candidates. And I also don't feel like Duda's quite the same guy. I think Duda and Report have made the biggest gains since the games that they've played. I mean, Report, it's easy to say. That was eight years ago. So, But this is the only game they've ever played in Classical. So I have to show it. I mean, it, you know, it is the case. But our final opponent, and I did so talk about this in the introduction, uh, our final opponent is Fabiano Caruana. Fabiano Caruana is the highest, like, ever rated player, not, not right now, but ever in this field. Uh, incredibly experienced. This is fourth candidates in a row. Uh, was, I think, the only player not to lose a classical game to Magnus in a world championship match. Everybody else has lost the game. Uh, Karyakin did beat him in a game, but he also lost. And at his peak form, this man is probably the best player in the field. At his peak form, which is 2850. Right now, he's not at that rating, but he also has played Hikaru more than any player in this field, and he is the only player that has a winning classical record against Hikaru. Seven wins, six losses. The last time that Hikaru defeated Fabiano was 2015 Norway Chess, I think, in classical. Hikaru dominates Fabi in Rapid and Blitz. I think 50 to 20 or something like that, two and a half to one. Um... So, this man, when he's on form, is probably the favorite to win this entire tournament. So, the last time that they played a, a classical game was 2019, and Hikaru went for his patented Queen's Gambit decline. So, he's kind of had this ultra-solid approach. They played, and we are looking at it from Fabi's perspective for a reason, they played an ultra-main line. In fact, this line, all the way to here, is what Fabi played with Black against Magnus in the World Championship match. And I believe in that game, he played the move rook d8. Fabiano played this move, which was like almost never played before. And he ended up equalizing against Magnus easily. And Magnus never went back to the Queen's Gambit decline, maybe one more time, but that was it. But the move that Hikaru plays, rook e8, aims for chaos, complete chaos, okay? So this is what it aims for. e5, okay? Knight into d4, what the heck, what? Takes, takes, and now there's a check, and this is, okay. So white moves out of the way. Bishop f5, attacking the queen with that knight that can't be taken. And look at this. What is going on? Now, if you look in the database, Hikaru's played this about five or six times with black. Uh, maybe he won once, made some draws. I think the only game he lost is in front of you. And um, I'm sure he's played it afterward, but as, as far as I checked the database, this was sort of... Uh, fascinating what Fabiano did here. So this move attacks this. Uh, there are games in the database here where white takes on e4. I think with the d knight and with the c knight. But this move is interesting because you give up the bishop, 
you fork those two pieces, you win the bishop, knight e6, and here Fabi plays a novelty. So computer looks at castles here, queen b1 to target b7. Fabi plays queen f5, which at the time had never ever happened. And that is actually one of the things that you need to deal with when you play Caruana, particularly when you're black. His prep is incredible. Everywhere. So drawing Fabi and taking on the rest of the field for wins would be, in, would be great. All right? And Fabi in this game shows the prep, and now let's see if he's going to get the win. I mean, my man plays king e2. Like, in the middle of a board of queens, knights, and rooks, just plays king e2, understanding that he doesn't need to castle h5. Let's see how Hikaru deals with this. All right? e4, because he's going to have to deal with this throughout the candidates, particularly with guys like Caruana, uh, who has excellent prep. Ding Li Ren is a very consistent guy. I would argue that probably Hikaru's preparation is... I mean, Caruana's number one in the tournament, and I mean, second or third probably is Hikaru. So... Knight d2, Hikaru grabs the pawn on a3. And he's basically saying, Fabi, this doesn't make sense. I'm getting way too close to your king here. I mean, this just can't possibly be good, right? It's a hunt for the king. Rook h4. Allowing the check and understanding that the king on e1 is completely safe. And only one man has to worry about his king. And it's not Fabiano. So Hikaru plays rook d8. Fabi grabs the pawn exposing his king even more and hiding it on e1 hiding it on f1 and now he's going to g1 if you keep checking him knight e4 rook e4 and suddenly everything in the white position makes sense suddenly the white king is safe the white rooks are incredibly strong in the main files the pawn on g7 is the only thing holding the black position from falling apart you could be willing to bet that once h6 comes black will lose very quickly how did it happen it all started with queen f5 a combination of queen f5 and h4, h5. Very interesting play here from Fabiano. Queen f5, pushing the pawn up and making the black position very difficult to control, followed by the infiltration of the rook, hiding the king on f1 and g1. And now the position looks perfect. Now Caruana can, by the way, go wreck it Ralph and just destroy the position, but he chooses to play rook b1, knight g5, rook d4, consolidating a little bit before just calmly picking up a pawn. Now black is a pawn down along with the bad position. Look at this queen b1 move. Fabi controlling the king, defending this, and uh, just calm king g1. Just let me get the king out of the way real quick before I advance my c-pawn. And everything we've seen Hikaru do in this video to all his opponents where he dominates the game on three sides, right now Fabi's doing that, right? Now, Hikaru's also beaten Fabiano, make no mistake. The score is 7-6 in classical. It's, it's close. But Fabi has the most recent classical wins. Three or four of them, I think, since 2015. So, rook c8, knight f4, knight e5. And I told you a long time ago, when this move comes, the black position will fall apart. And it does. Because now g6, f6, and h7 are all exposed. Fabian, look at this. He plays a little boop, boop, boop. Little, uh, little snake, you know? Remember that game? Snake, you gotta jump around in the grid. And that's it. Black resigns because rook h7, rook g7 is coming. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this was from the Grand Chess Tour in 2019 in Zagreb, Croatia. As I said, I think Fabiano, for Hikaru in particular, is definitely the tallest task. Two draws would be super. Getting a win would be, I mean, just a dream if Hikaru can, like, out-prepare him with white or something, get him into an uncomfortable situation. Nepo and Firuja are probably the next two biggest challenges for Hikaru. But there are chances for him to win this entire tournament, and, um... With the form that he showed in the Grand Prix, I, I, and, and, and seemingly like the emotional and mental state that he's in, the much more positive space than from the time he was just solely a professional chess player, these things are really possible. So I wanted to showcase this, read off a few stats, show a couple of cool games, and um, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know in the comments if you did. Let me know if you want me to do more of these kind of head-to-head matchups. I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.